this webinar. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're here today to talk about how building safety standards in the social housing sector have changed uh, since the Grenfell Tower fire six years ago. Um, obviously, uh, for, for, for very good reasons, um, a lot of focus is placed on areas where change hasn't happened and things where um, progress is happening too slowly in, in this area. But sometimes that overlooks the change that has been made and the progress that has been made in um, both fixing existing buildings with fire safety issues and making sure that the ones we build in the future are up to a better standard than what came before. And achieving what has been achieved over the last six years has, has taken a lot of hard work from a lot of different people, um, some of whom we're going to hear from today. Um, my name is Pete. Uh, I'm the deputy editor at Inside Housing. I've also written a book about the Grenfell Tower fire um, called Show Me the Bodies. And I reported uh, on almost every day of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Um, but you're not going to hear too much from me today. It's going to be our terrific panel who um, lead the discussion. Um, we're going to hear from each of them in turn and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to move on to our first of four terrific speakers, and that is going to be Vicky Saunders, who is the Managing Director of BTP Architects. Um, so by way of a, a quick introduction to Vicky, she's an award-winning specialist in housing design with extensive knowledge in all types of housing, new build refurbishment, supported living and extra care. Um, Vicky's developed a particular spe specialism in tower block refurbishment and fire safety following Grenfell. Um, she's currently working on 14 high rise refurbishment projects across the Northwest, including the iconic Lighthouse and Moho apartments in Manchester. Um, she's worked with uh, social housing providers, including Great Places, and she's worked with new technology such as BIM. And she works on the golden thread of information and the, 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 the new regulations that are coming in that many people on this call are having to deal with and understand and grapple with in their organisation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Vicky has to say and I'll hand straight over to her now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Okay, so without further ado, I shall make a start. My presentation is going to touch on the regulatory changes since Grenfell and also my practical experience. If I could have the uh, next slide, please, and the next slide. OK, so the Building Safety Act became law on the 28th of April and the secondary legislation to follow, but also recent developments that we've got to be aware of since uh, post Grenfell are the pledge. The Building Safety Act, uh, you know, that will stop developers if they don't sign up. They're obliged to, uh, you know, pay for the repairs and reimburse taxpayers where public money has been spent. Spent on the 17th of March also, uh, there is the infrastructure levy charge, which is out to consultation which will replace section 106s. On the 21st of March, 2023, the government unit is investigating bad faith actors, the building safety crisis, you know, and piloting a scheme for medium rise buildings between 11 and 18 meters and raising 3 billion to over 10 years, you know, to over 10 years. There is the two staircase issue into play as well. And we've also got the changes to the social housing regulation bill where managers are going to have to be qualified uh, to drive high levels of service for residents. OK, so that is a, a quick overview. Go to the next slide, please. What is a high rise building? Well, it's 18 metres or at least seven storeys. It's hospitals, care homes or residential. If you can go to the next slide, the, uh, the new secondary legislation will embody duty holders. So there's duty holders and gateways. These gateways are, sorry, the duty holders are the client, the principal designer, principal contractor. Don't get these confused with CDMC. CDMC is about drawing the bill, people go home for the tea. This principal designer and principal contractor is about making sure the pack of information, the golden thread is delivered throughout all of the, the project delivery and it's useful and proportionate. Also, it's a fence for duty holders to start work without the BSR approval. Okay, next slide, please. Moving into sort of the gateways, obviously gateway one is already in at the planning stage. And in October this year, we're going to be looking at gateway two or gateway and gateway three being introduced. There is a transitional period 
uh, if the, the reg, if you've made your building reg submission before October, and you can start it before April, you know you won't these regs won't apply. But there are more stringent controls on what means to start. And also, it's worth noting that there is a change control between gateways two, which is the building reg submission hard stop must be approved before you can start on site. Gateway three hard stop you must have sign off before you can practically complete. Uh, there'll be my, m notifiable changes and major changes. So really, that's a, a, a whistle stop tour of you know what's what's coming down the tracks in since Grenfell. Moving on to sort of uh, the next slide, please. Moving on to some of what's been happening, I think the biggest thing that we've got is the illusion of control that we've had since 2005 to really Grenfell 2017. The top corner is the lighthouse uh, fire. It was a significant fire after Grenfell. And then we've got on the, the, the left, uh, sorry, the right hand side is what actually we found. And if you think that that picture on the top right with those sort of like red little slugs is actually, they're the cavity barriers, well, they're actually for masonry. Uh, they weren't actually for rain screen. So the truth of the matter is, is that we're opening up a can of worms with every building with the belief that the illusion, that, that, that they were regulated. If I could have the next slide, please. So the biggest thing is we don't know how our buildings are constructed, and we don't. And how is everybody responding now to, to this? Well, we're still budget driven. I understand that, appreciate that. But the budgets are still driving everything. We've got the unopening of all these horrors that we see on site. And then we've got variations. And then we've got time delays in getting these variations through. You know, we are making betterment in all of, you know, what we touch. But contractually, you know, budget wise, it will only go so far. Next slide, please. This is a good example of uh, a process which has followed, even though it's in before, has followed the golden thread in delivering a refurbishment to what was a combustible render system. And I listen house through to the, the pictures. Well, hopefully you can see which ones have been finished. Uh, we were involved on an intermediate form of contract where we're involved in every step of the way. The uh, final issue drawings record absolutely everything that was done on there. And so it's an, the client has now got an accurate record a good information for the fire brigade and for themselves to know exactly what works have been done for them to move forward with their repairs. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, Boland House, this was a national pilot of the golden thread of information that we carried out with great places. And again, this is another example using design, design and build contract where you have engagement and duties and responsibilities to come on site and support to make sure that the golden thread of information is delivered and that the client, at the end of the day, all variations, all changes to scope are picked up. And if we can move on to the, the next slide, which is the lighthouse, which I've talked about. And I think really why I put this one up, I know you've, I've talked about it, but one of the issues that this one really faces, if you can see, it's landlocked by buildings. We couldn't actually inspect it until we'd got the cradles up there and the scaffolding up there. We could do some opening up, but we couldn't find out the truth of the building. And this shows the issues that we actually face in that the reality is we get on site with the best one in the world. We can only do so much in the first instance. So moving on uh, to the final slide, this is one that we're currently working on at the moment. And again, it's I put this on because it just shows that even the pictures on the left hand side show it before. When we opened it up, you can see in the middle, at the middle top, the horrors that we've uncovered on this, uh, that we've had to unpack. Below it is us putting in the side rise, putting in the fire barriers and you know the elevations and the care and the consistency that we've gone through and the rigour that we've got set up on site to actually deliver what is looking like a really uh, a, a good finish on those buildings. And because we're involved, we can help the contractor pick up these, these elements. So if we move on to sort of a final sort of slide, uh, which is how do we move forward? Well, we've got the government changes 
we've got the gateways and the tracking processes that should enable us to help uh, you know protect this golden thread um, but we've also got possible potential how is this going to be Im implemented you know we've got the secondary legislation which as far as i'm aware we haven't got how is it going to look we've got a new portal we're going to have to navigate we're going to have to go via the building safety regulator for building regulations we're in march this is due for october so it'll be an interesting time and the the potential is that it'll cause delays so i think key important things are the strategy that is written at gateway one should be extended into the rba stages two and four and this should be followed through to completion and the fire safety pack signed off as regulation 38 building regulations and handed to the responsible person for the fire and the registered providers and everybody else must not have that person in isolation. He must be operating in conjunction with the building safety managers and building maintenance managers. And that fire stuff should embody all the production information and the final issue and be as it is actually built. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Vicky, and, and thank you for sticking rigorously to time. That was almost to the second. Um, please do, if you're uh, watching in the audience and you have questions for Vicky, please do submit them via our chat function or um, <clears throat> hold on to them for the, um, the Q&A section at the end. Um, I am going to move swiftly on to our next speaker, who is Andy Sturgis. Um, Andy is a National Specification Manager at ICO. Uh, he is um, originally from the East Midlands, but he um, left college and spent time in Liverpool as a personal trainer. <laughs> until deciding to join the <laughs> RA. Um, <laughs> um, so after completing some time in the, with the military, Mr Sturgis um, went to an electrical warehouse and moved to ICO in 2016. Um, since then, he's developed his role and works alongside many partners in the social housing sector and with electrical contractors. Um, Mr. Sergis is currently enjoying the um, Internet of Things focus direction in the sector um, and finding new ways to, 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 to get solutions to these sometimes difficult, sometimes intractable seeming problems that, 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 um, that the whole sector faces on, on answering these questions about building safety. So without further ado, over to you, Andy. Thanks, Pete. Cool. So uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about the resident safety campaign uh, that's been running for, for a few years now uh, and kind of um, the thought process behind it and some of the findings, um, the generalised findings. I mean, it is pretty common sense, to be honest with you, um, but some of the findings off the back of it. Uh, we're then going to talk about some pretty positive news in regards to uh, the impacts of some legislative uh, changes and just the general attitude towards fire safety, which is our predominant um, element that we deal with on a, on a regular basis uh, and the outcomes, uh, especially up in Scotland. So if we could move on. So as you can see there, the resident safety campaign, it was designed to promote best practice of resident safety. So as we know, um, it's a two way street and the residents need to engage with you. Um, at the end of the day, um, it's their house, they're living in it. Uh, and uh, for it to be a safe place, they need to work with uh, the landlord um, to ensure um, that they are open communications at all times. Um, so the campaign was basically um, designed around a competition, um, inviting housing associations um, who've run safety campaigns to basically show how they did it, how they engaged, um, and the uh, issues that they were dealing with on a regular basis. Now, I know we'll have um, uh, Liz speaking shortly. So she was the winner of the, the first competition <laughs> that was ran on this side of things. So she'll have a lot more detail to go into and talk to you about uh, the project uh, that, that, that she dealt with. Um, but to be honest with you, as you'll see, um, the results and um, the findings were very, very uh, positive across the board. We move forwards. So there was plenty of entries, plenty of shortlists, um, loads, of, um, loads of loads of great campaigns across the board that we, we saw. Um, but the key findings we got out the back of this um, where again, predominantly common sense, um, but obviously you've got to apply them and you've got to scale them and you've got to be consistent with them. And those were the, the key things. So as you can see that predominantly um, multilingual, multiple media formats uh, for messaging, but the the biggest um, results came from actually letting the residents lead 
on how that communication was was pushed out. So rather than going, well, we're going to present this information to you like this, uh, they asked the, the more successful landlords asked the residents, how do you want to be communicated with? What's the most efficient way to receive that? Um, the best results were actually face to face. Um, they were um, yeah, hand delivering awareness information, knocking on doors, engaging with the residents on a on a personal basis. Uh, that got the, the largest feedback and the campaigns that were successful uh, in winning and being shortlisted and had a very, very, very pers person based impact um, in regards to how they did um, their engagement, especially in high rise buildings and buildings uh, with uh, large concentrations of residents. Uh, the messaging needs to be kept very simple. Um, we, we see it on a regular basis. There's a lots of bulletin messages with A4 sheets of paper with four or five hundred words on there where the, the messaging and the key messaging can get lost uh, amongst it. As you can see on the right, uh, some examples there from some of the uh, some of the shortlisted entries, key, simple messaging, the common sense stuff that's going to predominantly reduce fire risk in buildings, especially those uh, with a large density of dwellings. Um, for example, as you can see there, um, how um, you'd evacuate a building, keeping your balconies clear, not overloading the sockets, all the simple stuff. But as we know, they're the things that cause fires. Um, by taking a proactive approach to these campaigns, um, they were there was a very high success rate on there. So across the board, if you average it out, um, you've got uh, over an 85% success, uh, success rate on engagement and interaction with the residents with a very positive response um, across the board. So uh, very, very positive findings. So yeah, um, on to a bit more boring, but no less important stuff. Um, there were updates to detection policies. Um, so across the board, we were seeing that many, many landlords were taking a proactive approach, not only with our side of things in regards to detection, uh, but many other elements such as fire doors, prevention, compartmentalization. Um, but the key things we've changed, we've seen change recently um, is that um, the approach to policy has changed. There's no longer this mindset of we've just got to fit the minimum. Most people are going above and beyond. They're complying to best practice, which is the British standard. Um, massive drive to fulfill FRA actions. Um, it's actually been an overwhelmingly positive response from the majority of landlords uh, that I engage with. And I, I engage with a lot of landlords on a, on a regular basis. Um, and obviously the key reason behind that is that the better level of detection system you've got in there, it gives them the earliest possible warning. So in a lot of your schemes, you'll have stay put policies, but you still don't want to be in your flat if there's a fire is the best way of looking at it. So it allows the resident to evacuate and get the fire rescue service there as quickly as possible, hopefully to minimum disruption. Um, there's been a massive increase um, from landlords um, driving resident engagement days. So actually, as we've already talked about, getting that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with residents, um, not just sending out letters and hoping they read them, you know, getting, getting onto schemes, getting into blocks, getting into regions, inviting residents to engage with people like ourselves, the fire and rescue service, the installers of upgrades, the works across the board, um, that um, that personal interaction makes a massive, massive di difference in impact, um, especially when a lot of the time you're actually um, engaging with uh, younger people, children. They're the ones who really actually pick up what they should be doing if there is a, an incident in their building. Interesting bit there at the bottom. Um, Scotland is massively ahead of the sector um, in regards to uh, the minimum level of protection in domestic dwellings um, to the point where um, LD2, so an enhanced level of protection, is mandatory across every home in the country um, and has been a thought. It's been officially in place since February 2022. Moving on. So what we were actually really interested in um, was to find out whether or not that made a difference. So what we did, we commissioned a report uh, with CEBR um, in regards to the fire safety standards and regulations um, across the UK. Um, and it was across 6,000 people. So a big old survey, there was a lot of, a lot of, was a lot of um, work went into this. It was a big old pool of, uh, of questions sent out. Uh, and there were three parts to this research. So there was a comparison of the regulations and standards across the four nations, um, an analysis of all the fire incidents in the dwellings, and there was an economic impact study. So number one and two are the ones that we focus on, well, I'll, I'll mention in this section here. Um, off the back of this, if you do want this research, um, let me know and we can push it on because it's actually really, really interesting. Uh, and there's some there's some quite quite big old numbers in there. Can we move on to the next slide. So what are the key findings? So 
the biggest one is, is since the implementation of the tolerable standard in Scotland, um, they had a two year, then extended to three year um, implementation deadline. So it kind of finally came into effect February last year. Um, literally from that year, from 2019, we have seen a 47.5 reduction in fatalities from fires in Scotland, which is a massive number, it's nearly half. It is half, isn't it? So we've seen a massive, massive reduction. Um, the number of fire-related incidents have actually been falling year on year. Um, but since um, the implementation of the legislation, the number of incidents has been dropping as well because of the awareness and that, that level of protection. Um, and these examples, they definitely um, highlight Scotland's resident safety first approach to legislation. This was a very proactive decision made, well, in the grand scheme of things, in a relatively short period of time after Grenfell. Uh, and uh, it has obviously, as you can see, they made a massive difference. But if you want that information, obviously, uh, we can we can disseminate that afterwards. Um, and that is me. Thank you very much for listening in. Thank you very much for that, Andy. Um, just a quick encouragement to, to anyone watching. Um, please use the chat box to submit questions for our speakers. We are going to have a little bit of time at the end um for discussion and it's a really great opportunity to ask some people with some real world insight um anything that's 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 difficult for you at the moment or anything you'd like a little bit more insight on or to turn the discussion in that direction so please do make use of that um but first we're going to hear from liz oliver who is a safer homes and neighborhoods director at the hyde group um the hyde, hyde group were one of the first out of the blocks on um building safety uh, i remember uh, just in a month after Grenfell, the, the the investigations they were doing into their blocks and the um, work that followed as a result uh, was really kind of leading the the the, the UK social housing sector and, and um, what a lot of people are just catching up to now. And Liz has um, led in safer homes and compliance roles across the housing sector for more than 10 years um, for organisations such as Homes for Haringey and Optivo. Uh, she's also been a building safety ambassador for us at Inside Housing. Um, she's passionate about keeping residents and buildings safe. Um, she's headed up Hyde's Safer Homes team for three years. And under her leadership, Hyde has carried out major building safety work on a number of high-rise residential buildings and thousands of other smaller projects. Um, she's leading Hyde's building safety program. So she's very much across the, the, the latest legislation and the latest requirements for compliance and, and you know, both what that means uh it, it, on paper and, and the difficulties of getting it done um in practice uh her approach always focuses on engaging with residents and being honest open and supportive Hyde has demonstrated to residents stakeholders and government that is a sector leader in building safety so um liz i'm sure many of our um audience are, are, are very much looking forward to hear you speak to hand over to you now thanks pete and, and thanks kind of for very much for kind of inviting me along so yes yeah, so i've been at Hyde now for for actually about three and a half years and i'm not sure sure where that time has gone um and yeah we we were the first kind of one of the first winners of the resident safety campaign and, and a campaign that for me is is the kind of and, and we call it, we see golden thread quite a lot but it's definitely the golden thread of ensuring that we have that customer engagement with a, with kind of every single customer that we interact with and it's really hard you know i'm not i'm not going to lie so our kind of um our kind of kind of nomination into the, the kind of the, the first um resident engagement award was, was for gosport and, and gosport was quite a complex um major recladding project it's got five tower blocks um quite contained and they all sit kind of on the kind of soul and straight um the they were kind of basically wrapped in plastic um for, for quite a while um the, the kind of the team that picked it up it, it was very new it was something that that was kind of evolving um not just day by day but hour by hour and how we kind of interact with customers the works that we're doing the kind of the changes that were coming out um, in terms of policy and um, guidance from, from government but also looking at, at the sector as a whole and the position that we, that we wanted to take um, so, so with Gosport, um, it, it covers about 400 properties um, and we, we kind of started the works, but we really felt early on that that, that resident engagement wasn't wasn't right. Um, 
and we were having a few complaints. And you know, I'm completely always open and honest because I think we we have areas of improvement, and this is one of the biggest areas of improvement that Hyde went through, and that we continue to build on for resident engagement. Um, and, and there was just things that were obviously a fear amongst that time where we had said to customers, we've got some combustible materials on your block, we have to remove it, we're going to be kind of scaffolding all the blocks, we're going to be wrapping it in plastic, might not be able to kind of see very much, um, and we're working along that. So kind of after um, a couple of weeks of, of the project kind of being in flight, we stopped and we thought actually we need to kind of get better engagement with our customers and, and, and the kind of the local stakeholders as well. So kind of the council, the fire and rescue service. And, and some of these things that we did sound really, really simple. So we had um, like coffee mornings, we produced leaflets, we set up dedicated team to kind of go in and speak to the customers and um, we used the contractors that were on site we had resident liaison officers within that everything was very visible and the whole process was knowledgeable and, and there was one um area where i think it was one of the kind of the, the queen's jubilees or queen's birthdays and there was going to be a fly past and and the customers like we really really want to see that you know it's flying over the, the solent straight we know that it's a kind of a great area for environmental impact, but we'd really, really want to see this. Um, and it was something, again, that we didn't really consider. So we kind of managed to kind of create kind of a window so the, the, the customers could, could watch the kind of the flyby. Um, and, and we kind of really started to kind of engage with the customers and ask for their honest feedback. And as we continued with that project, um, we have now seen that what we've done really, really works, but not only works for our customers that we've had great rapport now and, and great feedback from, from the local authority. And actually, um, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service used the towers as a training exercise for, for their kind of firefighters and got the customers really involved in that. So kind of reflecting on that, I wanted to ensure that we took that forward in everything that we were doing in terms of building safety, fire safety. And I've recently taken on um, a new role of kind of looking after the neighbourhoods. So for me, open, honest, transparent conversations has got to be at the heart of everything that we do. And sometimes they're really difficult and sometimes we're not going to provide the customers with the answers that we particularly want. But having the ambassadors of the customers behind you so that they can really see what you're trying to move forward and trying to achieve is always going to be the best thing that you can do. And if I give you a couple of examples, so when we were working through um, the requirements of the Building Safety Act and the Fire Safety Act, we set up a customer building safety uh, panel and it wasn't just for customers that were in our high rise high risk blocks it was open to all the customers who really felt that they wanted to kind of have an input and have an understanding in how we deliver building safety <clears throat> and that takes place we, we have a meeting kind of once a quarter but what what that group do is we ask them to kind of check the kind of the comms that we're thinking of publishing, so um, some fire safety notices, um, the tone of voice and the way some of the letters we're doing, we're, we're sending out, but also really thinking about where English isn't a customer's first language and where there may be problems. So we've started to kind of adapt and become more pictorial. We're doing videos of like, show me how, and, and that has worked really, really well. And, and I think, it, you know, I am incredibly lucky because I have an absolutely phenomenal team that work with me, not just in the building safety side, but in our comms team. They're always kind of really forward thinking and really challenge me. But I have now a group of customers who I can really ask for their honest opinion. 
and it's really honest <laughs> you know they there is no way they they kind of they don't kind of hold back but doing that ensures that we're creating an environment that everybody can feel safe and secure in their property because that's that's all people want is to go to bed at night feeling safe in their property and, and for me, you know, if, if any kind of housing associations are kind of sat on here in organisations, please, and you've got some great examples, please put yourself forward for, for these awards because they are absolutely instrumental and they bring the customers along in that journey. And just probably my kind of final little point is just, just listen. And no matter, you know, we, we're all so busy, but sometimes just taking that extra five minutes to speak to the customer because they will give you things in such a different perspective. Um, I, as I've said, I'm absolutely kind of delighted to have kind of been asked to, to speak here. I hope what I've went through kind of shows the kind of the passion that as a housing sector and everybody, the speakers that are here want to kind of achieve in terms of, of kind of resident engagement building and fire safety and I will pass back over to Pete. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Liz. Um, I'm now going to move on to our final speaker before we move to Q&A and that is Stephen, Stephen Flounders, who's Director of Risk and Assurance at Gen2 Group based in Sunderland. Um, Mr Flounders has strategic oversight of Gen 2's response to changes to building and fire safety legislation. His team is currently working on safety cases and digital information for Gen 2's 25 high-rise buildings and developing the organisation's tenant and resident engagement strategy. So we're going to be hearing from Stephen about the work he does at Gen 2, how he manages the high-rises and specifically the resident engagement strategy that he's developed. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, and it's great to, to hear from uh, from all of the other speakers as well. Lots of uh, lots of insight. Um, and so, what I'm going to talk around today uh, is also around resident engagement and how we've been approaching that at Gen Two, um, particularly over the past few years. Um, so, just a bit of context in terms of us of, as an organisation. Um, we were a stock transfer um, a social landlord, so we came out of Sunderland City Council back in 2001. Uh, we've got 25 um, high rise buildings across Sunderland um, and they all fall within the scope of the Building Safety Act. So we're, we're lucky on the one hand that our um, population of, of high rise blocks is, um, is not as geographically uh, sparse and dispersed as what uh, as what other um, organisations are. So we, we've got a real focus on um, the 25 blocks that we have across the city of Sunderland. Um, 23 of those blocks are a traditional uh, high rise construction and we've got two of those that are um, modern day or more modern day rather um, construction that, that just creep over um, 18 metres. So our approach in terms of building safety, we've, we've got this spread across different areas of the organisation. Um, and our intention around that is to make sure that we have um, the right people doing the right type of work. So my team lead on the strategic arrangements that we have around setting out our policy, our arrangements for, for tenant and resident engagement. And we work really closely with um, our investment colleagues, and our maintenance colleagues on making sure that we invest in the right ways in our buildings and that we're maintaining everything within those buildings that we need to. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resident engagement. I suppose, first of all, for us, why resident engagement is, is so important. Um, we've got to realise that one of the most important things um, post Grenfell that as a sector that we've got to do uh, better is, is better tenant and resident engagement. Um, I think Grenfell, you know, serves as a a real indication as to if we don't listen to our residents and their communities what can go wrong um, and there's been a, a lot of work an enormous amount of work done uh, across the sector uh, and across many organizations to to get to grips with this but when you look at things like recent cases with with damp and mold um, it shows really that we still do have to do more as a sector to to engage and to, to listen and to empathize and understand um, our residents the fundamental principle that we operate on is that all of our residents have, have got a right to live in a safe and decent home um, and that's kind of our our core purpose our starting point with everything that we do is to to look to make sure that we provide that for our our residents um and i think whilst we 
wait for secondary legislation and guidance to come out of um, of secondary legislation and the building uh, the building safety act and the recent fire safety changes um, resident engagement is something that the sector can be getting on with now we don't need to wait we know that that's something that we've got to do better and that's kind of that's our approach um, that we've been taking at gen 2 over the, the past couple of years um, our approach to, to building safety as a whole, but also resident engagement, it's evolved over the past couple of years and it'll continue to do so. I don't think there'll ever be a point where we think, right, we've, we've got everything nailed, we're doing everything that we need to do. The demographics of the people living in our properties change, economic circumstances change, investment priorities change. So resident engagement really for me is something that is a, is a continuous development. Um, we can always do more, but it's about listening and working out how we can engage effectively Effectively with our residents in the way that appeals and, and suits um, suits them. When I think about the work that we've done um, on resident engagement, uh, specifically in relation to building safety, I really go back to um, to kind of late 2019 and a, a multi-million pound project that we had uh, to remove timber from one of our high-rise buildings. Um, so we began that project shortly after um, a fire in Barking um, in London, which spread uh, across the timber balconies. And, and that for us was a real kind of pivotal moment, I suppose, in terms of it, it was the the first large scale remediation uh, work that we've um, that we've done. And it gave us a real opportunity to look at how we engage with the tenants and the residents. But if I'm being really honest, I think we missed an opportunity with that project. I think we we, we did the the traditional engagement around the impact that the work would have on the people living in the property, um, you know, the fact that it was going to be covered in scaffold for a significant period of time. We talked to them about what we were doing, but with hindsight, we, we could and we should have done more to discuss the building safety implications. You know, we we wanted to rectify and remediate the building as, as quickly and as effectively and efficiently as what we could, but we should have we should have done more to engage the tenants on the on the why um, and what we were doing. Um, and that's something that now when I think about how we engage with our tenants and residents on building safety, I kind of go back to that and think, right what could we have done more? And that's something that we're now trying to to apply across everything that we do. Um, we're currently working on a modernization project in one of our high rise buildings. So we've got some building safety work to do uh, within that property on the back of our recent program of external wall assessments. Um, but the, the bulk of that work is around modernization of the block, installation of sprinkler systems uh, and some other uh, safety related um, work. But what we're doing here is really targeting some of our engagement with our residents in that block. And we're trying a range of different methods here to try and really establish and work with our tenants to, to find out what is the best way for us to, to engage with them, what works for them rather than what works for us. We don't just want to take the easy option of your traditional approach of, of letter dropping and, and leaflets and, and whatnot. We want to really understand and work with our residents to see what works for them. So we've done some targeted engagement sessions specific to building safety as well as the, the work that are going to be taking place. We've held drop-in sessions. Um, we've developed digital twins um, across all of our 25 high-rise blocks. We've really invested the time um, in this property to take our residents through the digital twin, help them to understand why it's important, but really help them to understand the layout of their building so that they can see all of the other elements of the building that they may not be aware of and how we manage those areas of the building as well. One of the key things that we've done that we'll be looking to really take forward as we as we move through the next 12 months um, is we've established it and we call it an involved tenant group um, with representatives from across our high rise buildings. And we're really relying on that group um, and representation of tenants to help us shape our uh, future engagement strategy and really inform how we can best engage with our residents. We realise that we, we need to go back to basics with some of our engagement. You know, we we're in the position where you know we won't have huge amounts of of recladding and and that type of ongoing refurbishment work that some of the sector is facing but we've got to make sure that we engage with our tenants and residents on some of the basics that they can do in their homes and that we can do as the, the landlord to support them so we're currently just working out around a focus there's been lots of recent um fires in in high rises and in um in general housing around e-scooters um and, and the likes as well so we're doing a lot of targeted engagement um on that over the coming months to really help engage and work with our tenants and residents i suppose 
the couple of key points really just to, to get across really as well is how do we understand the demographics of our residents? We really need to understand who lives in our blocks, um, what difficulties we may have with engaging them so we can look to overcome some of that with some really targeted engagement. We've done a lot of work on that already around more of our vulnerable residents who may be unable to leave buildings if, if, by themselves without assistance in the event of a fire and partnering with our local fire and rescue service as well uh, to make sure that we know where those residents are, we know what vulnerabilities they may have and that we've got plans to assist them to evacuate if we needed to initiate a, a partial or a full evacuation of the building. I suppose my final thought, um, because I'm conscious that I'm probably running out of time, um, as I've said, we, we've got to continue to evolve our approach to resident engagement. We've got to continue to listen, to empathise and seek out the best ways to engage with our residents because a one size fits all approach just will not work. We are lucky, as I said at the start, that we've got 25 blocks within you know, a four or five mile radius. So we can really focus our engagement and be really specific and targeted, but we've got to go the extra mile. We've got to reach out to those tenants who it may be difficult for us to, to get in touch with usually. Um, and we've got to learn, I think, from the mistakes that we've made um, in the past to make sure that we don't repeat them again and that's me thank you very much for that Stephen um, and thank you for um, to, to, to all of our presenters for, for um, giving us a really broad overview of things that are happening in the sector at the moment and the work that's being done challenges that we still face um, I do have some questions, uh, which I'm going to I'm going to come to in a moment. Several of them were, were, were requests for the research, um, which Andy talked about. I can can confirm that research is downloadable online um, via the Housing Safety and Wellbeing Task Force website. Um, th those of you who've requested it in the chat will will send a link out to you to to download that directly. Um, but moving on to some of the other questions which have come in. Um, this is quite a specific question, um, Stephen. So apologies for sort of bringing you back in and putting you straight on the spot. Um, but uh, we've been asked how, how many building safety managers Gen2 currently have, um, if any. Um, so we've just um, looked at our structure. So we we recruited a building safety manager um, when we initially when that was initially in the scope of the Building Safety Act. Um, we knew at the time that uh, that no one person was going to be able to do um, all of the work that was being stipulated by um, the accompanying um, codes of practice. So at the moment we've just restructured and we, we no longer have a building safety manager the route that we're going down now at the moment is we've got a specific building safety surveyor working in our property investment team um, and we're currently recruiting for a specific role to undertake tenant and resident engagement across our blocks and also a specific role to help us develop uh, and maintain our safety cases and digital information so we've taken the step at the moment um, to step back away from the what has become kind of your traditional building safety manager post and actually focus on where do we need the work to go over the next uh, two to three years to make sure that we meet our legislative requirements, that we can do everything we need to do with the right people doing it and that we can engage with our tenants and residents in the most effective way. Thank you for that answer, um, Stephen. Um, the questions are flying in now. Um, uh, we've got one here. Um, about budgets, and I think I'll come to to, to Liz with this first. Um, the, the the question is, uh, as as we all know, budget restraints really make decision making difficult. How did you manage the install of a sprinkler system and the recharging of this? I I, I think I'd probably broaden that question out a little bit. Um, Liz, if you could talk about sprinklers, I think I'd have, have some blocks with sprinklers, but um to to just how do you make these decisions you know there's there's so many interventions that you could make at a building you could be fixing the compartmentation you could be putting sprinklers in you could put an afd in where do you, how do you go through that process of prioritizing a limited budget to to make the most effective use of it i think kind of first and foremost of the safety of our customers is, is paramount and i think what what we we kind of the process that we went through was kind of building up the kind of the level of intelligence that we've got on. I mean, we've got eighty six um, high rise high risk blocks. We've got two hundred and forty two blocks that are under eighteen meters, and then we've got a couple of thousand that are kind of below kind of eleven meters. So we've kind of put together a, a ten year business plan 
And again, it's very kind of like subjective. So we kind of based it on what what we knew. So the kind of the, the amount of um, fire risk actions, what that, that was costing the business. Um, the the kind of the cost of some of those big upgrade and kind of recladding um, projects. Um, some of the interim fire safety measures that we were doing. And again, we, we kind of set up a, a kind of internal fire safety working group with, with key stakeholders, so from, from kind of service charges to uh, resident engagement to comms. And, it, and it's a really hard decision because you really do question yourself kind of morally about the costs that you could possibly be, be passing on. At this point in time, we have uh, not can be charged for any forms of of we can watch or any of the major rework, the uh, kind of kind of the recladding works. What we have done is obviously as as we kind of go through with our new builds, all new builds over eleven meters will have a standard sprinkler systems going in, and if we've had to retrofit, again we kind of borne the cost of that because we felt that we needed to at that point in time, and now that the building safety acts makes it a lot more kind of prescriptive on what we can and can't cannot charge for that is the methodology that that we have really kind of went along for but that there was many many months that there was a bit of kind of I think we were all kind of soul searching about because some of these potential bills that were going to go out were, were life-changing and, and we really really kind of didn't want to do that and again if we had a specific site that was undertaking a major project we were meeting with them on a monthly basis we meet with them on, on a monthly basis to give them an update on progress of works what we're doing um, and and really just trying to have that that level of proportionality of let's look at all of the layers of protection that we have got in the building at this point in time um, but it, it, it's really it, it is a really really tough tough old kind of gig to kind of discuss because you know I always try and put myself in, in a customer's shoes and if I was getting a, a potential bill for a kind of ten to kind of forty thousand pounds that that's that's life changing and particularly at the moment. So so we kind of I'm part of the, the G fifteen and um, building safety group so we kind of discussed our our approaches there and kind of took it forward from there really. Thanks Liz yeah um Certainly agree with you that the um, that issue of of what to recharge and how much to recharge is 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 is, is crucial um, and and getting that right is is, is difficult. Um, got a question? I'm I'm going to come uh, to to Vicky on. I think um, been asked about for an update really on the, the the efforts to raise competency in the construction sector um, from a. a attendee who said they were very shocked to see the pictures of those buildings once the cladding panels have been taken off um vicky kind of as someone who's at the coal face in the, the 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 construction sector obviously we've had the building safety act we have um the golden thread we have all of these um initiatives to to improve accountability and improve competency are you are you seeing that change on the ground do you feel like the construction sector especially with regard to high-rise buildings is different to to the one that we had in 2017 before the Grenfell Tower fire? Thanks for that. Uh, it's a difficult one because I'm working with some very good contractors out there who value uh, me being on site and looking at their work and issuing site inspection reports and supporting them, whether that's design and build or on um, intermediate forms. I also know that as this industry is a growth industry, there are companies setting up out there with different philosophies and uh, for instance I've been on remediation of projects with new workers and the cavity bats that now need to be mechanically fixed are off cuts and 300 mil not sufficient in length and I can just pull them all off so it is still there is the the past documentation of competencies to prove your competencies competencies by cave for contractors and for architects and I would welcome that but I still think you know the, the projects that I've worked on and I referenced uh, we've got a good level of understanding of what's been done I still think there is elements where there are shortcuts being taken because 
where anything, this is a growth area, there's companies that are springing up and doing a lot of this. So we're not out of the woods yet. The dangers are that we're facing high levels of, of you, you, checks and balances that, you know, the, the gateway two and three potentially have some bad timescale implications to, to get these qualities right. Um, Cloth works engaged, you know, full time on jobs. What full time means is is variable. Independent inspectors to to come round uh, to to also look at the projects with the building safety fund. It's a mixed bag, and I would strongly strongly advise you to have the right team. Um, thank you for that, Vicky. Uh, been asked here, but it's you know, there's a I could probably throw this to anyone in the panel, but I think I'm, I'm going to come to you first, Andy. Um, uh, we've been asked what the best initiative you've seen or implemented, um, particularly with regard to breaking down siloed working. Um, so something that, that can kind of bring teams together around the projects and make, make building safety something that's that's considered outside of just those who's, who, who focus it on it all the time. Um, and ensuring that it's, it's delivered, yeah, organisational wide. Um, have you have you seen that? Have you seen that achieved anywhere? Is that something that ICO, um, ICO can think of projects that that help make that happen? Yeah, to be honest with you, I mean, the biggest changes we're seeing now um, is it's gone very much from a the element of you've got a compliance team, they're in charge of fire safety, they do the fire safety, the fire safety is done, ticked off the list. <laughs> that's, that's that's basically how it always used to be um now um the approach is very much more well one it's very data driven which means you're getting a lot more stakeholders in the business involved you get you slowly go it's not just a case well those of you who um may have fit a few co alarms yeah last year might have realized well the regulator went well we need data you can't just say you've done it you've got to prove to us you've done it which then involves a number of other teams managing that data utilizing it but then off the back of it, to quantify it all, you've got to engage with your residents, you've got to gain access, you've got to ask them if it's working. So, I mean, the shift is happening. I don't, I don't, there's no, I mean, you, you've, we're finding that as, as digitalization is happening and people are getting more involved with actually pulling this data into properties remotely, managing it, um, more teams are getting involved because the information is easier accessible across organizations. So what, what, we, what we used to find is it'd be one person with the information. And that'd be it, or maybe a small team, and they they kind of they don't hoard it deliberately. It's just that well, it's it's their job and it's their information. Uh, and what we're finding now is that a lot more people are wanting this information, and that's only available if it's on a platform which is easily to easy, easy to share it out. So you've got stuff like, for example, what, what we do, we can do asset management systems. You've got your, your property stock management systems if that's working well. Um, but off the back of it, the main thing is it's um, it's when you have to start getting elements of the business involved that engage with residents um, from a less, I'd say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? From a less um, kind of like responsive repairs perspective. It's not, we're not just there to fix things. We're there to engage with you proactively so that one, you tell us about stuff. Two, we know what's going on before it becomes an issue anyway. Um, and because you're doing that, you're bringing in stakeholders such as your um, community liaison officers, you're bringing in your scheme managers, you're bringing in your, you know, your um, committees from your communities or your blocks. And then suddenly you're getting that resident in engagement. And then suddenly, once you start doing that and piecing all the bits together, um, it starts to work very well. And where we've seen it is mainly from a um, where we've, this is purely from a ACO perspective, where we've rolled out programs where residents can engage with the fire safety teams when it comes to the gas teams for co um when you start interacting with those residents you get you get you, you suddenly start to piece all the bits together and then you all you know it's a, you get a much better picture of what's going on thanks andy um i i am conscious we, we, we're sort of running into the last five minutes of our time here and i've got quite a lot of questions in the chat um some of which i really like to come to so i'll ask our panelists to be um, pithy and succinct in, in in answer to the next couple. So, um, uh, Stephen, apologies again for putting you on the spot, but um, you're being asked some specific questions, which is always good. Um, you you talked about engaging with vulnerable residents on evacuation. Um, the question is, ha have you gone as far as developing some form of PEEP for those who aren't, aren't up with the acronyms of Personal Emergency Evacuation Plan? Um, and just in your answer, if you would mind kind of giving us a flavour of what it is you have put in place um, for those residents. 
Yeah, that's fine. So we, we are trying to um, go down the route of, of looking at it from a more of a person-centred risk assessment rather than just explicitly referring it to a PEEP. So what we try to do, and it, this is carried out by my fire safety team, um, we try to look at the not just the vulnerability that, that may be specific that might stop the tenant from, um, from evacuating, but any other factors that may be contributing to that around, um, you know, just their, their, their general vulnerabilities as well. So we are terming them person-centred risk assessment. So we're taking a bit more more of a holistic approach so we've got those in place for all of our vulnerable tenants across um, across the properties and some of that includes looking specifically at how we would um, or how we would assist the fire and rescue service with um, rescuing them in the event of a fire we did a very detailed exercise with the fire and rescue service last year in one of our tower blocks where they were actually trying out and testing some of the new methods for <clears throat> um, for reaching um, tenants who may need a Assistance. So that included things such as uh, the Fire and Rescue Service taking up um, devices to assist them with carrying someone out, smoke hoods, so some really kind of simplistic but real potentially game-changing uh, responses that would help the Fire and Rescue Service work with us and with our tenants to make sure that if we needed to evacuate those tenants from the building that we all have the right knowledge as to what steps are needed. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um... I'm actually going to ask another question from the same person who asked that one, but this time I'm going to, I'm going to direct it towards Liz. Um, how, how has your engagement been with the fire and rescue service, um, Liz? Uh, I know it's, it's, all, it's not always the easiest relationship to manage um, and it differs around the country. And obviously Hyde works in a number of different fire and rescue um, services patches. So um, how has that um that that relationship work for you over the last six years and also um are you prepared for the launch of the building safety regulator is what our, our, our questioner wants to know i hope so <laughs> especially in case they're watching who knows yes um, definitely so kind of i can take the, the, the kind of the second part of the question first so so yes we have all of our um 86 tall towers um actually 69 that we've got the kind of the, the kind of principal authority um accountable person for so yeah and we've already kind of done the trial of the registration of the um of the kind of the regulators uh, registrations form so yeah we are all ready to go we've got all the information um, and as soon as that opens um first of april we, we will kind of be there ready to go and um, in terms of um you can, your, your, your first part of the question we Sorry, can you just kind of repeat it for me? Because I just I just want to make sure that I'm getting. Of course, you. I can. Um, so the 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 question specifically um was about how how your relationship with the fire and rescue service yeah. works. So we we are really really lucky. We have set up a new primary authority partnership with um, Hampshire and Isle of Wight um, fire and rescue service, and and actually they've been on site with us quite a lot over the last couple of weeks. Um, and they're really advocates of everything that we've doing. So we, we actually took them down to, to Gosport and showed them everything that we're doing in terms of building safety, fire safety, customer engagement, the whole kind of holistic approach that we're taking. And they were really, really complimentary on that. It does take time and you have to just kind of have that kind of open and honest approach and um, kind of the, the kind of, my, my head of building safety, Leslie, um, she she always kind of is there just to ask a question and the same as my, my head of fire safety is we have that open and honest dialogue and if we think that something's not quite right, we kind of just discuss it so there's nothing, we don't hide nothing and, and we kind of just always ask for that honest feedback. Sometimes we're like, mm, how did you come to this decision in terms of perhaps a notice of deficiency? But then when we kind of lay out everything, um, they kind of they, they really listen. But it is just that constant dialogue of uh, communication with them. And it's understanding that each kind of area, because we, as, as you said, we cover a lot of different kind of boroughs um, and, and kind of fire and rescue services, having that kind of primary authority partnership that can provide that consistent approach throughout all of your properties is really, really vital. Liz, thank you for that. I um, 
I was hoping to get a couple more questions in, but we have we have hit one o'clock now, and um, I'm conscious that we've we, we've we've asked a lot of our panelists um, in terms of giving up their time. So I will draw our discussion to a close there. Thank you once again to 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 all of our speakers and to all of those who put in some really interesting questions for the discussion. Um, I, I hope you got a lot out of that session and um, please do look up the research that Andy mentioned and, and download it and um, follow up with us if there's anything more you want to um, discuss. But for the time being, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all.